Good morning. I am so we have been going through a series this month about essentially being yoked with Jesus and what it means to take on and follow the easy yoke of the Lord. And we've talked about following him, we've talked about prayer, we've talked about fasting. You know, everybody's favorite subjects, all the things you're like, prayer, fasting, woo! And I get giving. Everyone's second favorite subject, probably after fasting, is I'm gonna talk about a lifestyle of giving. Um, but I'm actually really thankful and excited that I can share about it. Because I was telling Eric the other day that when you have experienced God's goodness in an area, you want to share it with people. It's like when you hear a good message or a good podcast, you share it because something in it was so good, all you want to do is give it to somebody else. And when it comes to giving, I have experienced the goodness of God's good God in immeasurable ways that I would hate to not at least share what his word says and what the benefit is. I feel like I would be amiss to hold back because there's a resistance towards it because God has something that he wants to unleash and he wants us to give him an opportunity to do that. So, <clears throat> I'm gonna start out actually, who in here, I don't know, let's see our, let me see my audience. Who in here likes the Marvel movies? Anybody? I was so glad when I saw a couple of faces, like younger faces today. So like, <laughs> okay, they're all right. But there is a line in the Avengers and Captain America is in a ship with Black Widow, and it's one of the first Avengers, and, and they're about to go fight these guys that are essentially taking over the world. And, and he's like getting ready, and he's suiting up, and he's got a shield, and he's getting ready to go, and, and Black Widow looks at him, and she's like, oh, whoa, you better just hold on, Captain America. You don't know who these guys are. They're like pretty much like gods. And Captain America, he's like still suiting up, and he looks at her, and he said, well, ma'am, I believe that there is one true God, and he doesn't dress like that. <laughs> and what I want to share with you today is that there is one true God, and it doesn't look like this. <laughs> and I want to unpack that a little bit in the scripture and feel like the Lord is highlighting the essence of when we give. It declares that there is one true God, and it's not that. So we're going to open up Matthew 6. We're going to start. I'm going to read a pretty good chunk of um, scripture and we're going to start in verse 19. This is right in the middle of um, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. He's been giving this extensive sermon. And I'm going to read from 619 to the end of the chapter. And then we're going to talk about how Jesus feels about giving and money. Are we there? All right. Ready? Let's do this. There's no enthusiasm. Are we ready? The word of God, <laughs> the word of God is powerful and it is life. All right, starting in verse 19, this is Jesus in the middle of this message. He says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. The lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, if your eye is good, your body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If, therefore, the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters, for he will either hate one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon or money. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow, sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to a stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin, and yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, 
Do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. As I was reading and studying this chapter, what I found was one common thread. And I didn't realize how this portion was actually linked together. But starting in verse 19, it says, Store up for yourselves heavenly treasures. Sow into the greater kingdom. Don't store up for yourself treasures on this earth because it's going to fade. There's a greater kingdom. And then it says if your eye is good. And if just with an English reading, you wouldn't understand that they're saying in that time when they said if you had a good eye, it's a generous eye. And if you had an evil eye, it's a stingy eye. So this is a continuous thought. So he said, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Let your eye be generous. Be generous and give. And then it says, you can't serve two master masters. You're going to love one or you're going to hate the other. But you can't be loyal to both. And Jesus continues, and then he says, therefore, do not worry. That word worry means to have a divided mind. But it says, seek first his kingdom, and everything else will be added to you. So in this passage of scripture, what I'm seeing is that he's saying that there is one true God and king, and it's not this. And he's saying that when we give, every time I give, I'm saying, Instead of saying, you are the Lord of my life, and you provide all of my needs, and you, money, paycheck, provision, you take care of me. You're, you're my king. You're the one that keeps the lights on. You're the one who pays the bills. You're the one. But every time I give, I say, you are a tool, and God is my provider. He is my king. He is my source, and you are not. And it basically it is saying I am putting everything in its rightful place. It is one true God, and it's Jesus, and he is the one that provides. And what we found in this whole series we've been talking about, I'm not going to talk about the what of giving. I'm going to kind of unpack a little bit like, like Jesus really likes to do. He likes to come in and be like, you're doing all this stuff, but I want to actually take and break this open and show you the heart of it. It's, it's the what's happening in the midst of it. It's the why. And I know that we have a good God, and he's a generous God, and his ways are better. Verse 24, this is what I want to kind of camp on. In Matthew 6, it says, No one can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So when I was reading some stuff in some commentaries about this, one of the commentaries talked about it was uncommon, but it would happen, that occasionally two siblings would inherit one slave. Like if there was an inheritance, you'd, let's say, had two brothers, and they would get one slave. And they would talk about how the slave would always be a little more partial to one of the masters than the other. And if you think about it, this is human nature. You are always going to be a little more partial to one another. Another example, talking about you will love one or hate the other, in the Old Testament, it talks about Jacob and Leah and Rachel. It says Rachel he loved, Leah he hated. But when you break down the words, it's not that he hated Leah, but he loved her less. He loved Rachel more. He didn't like, oh, Leah, I hate you. I can't believe I have to be married to you. Thank goodness. It was the fact that, like, you can't serve two. He loved Rachel, but Leah was okay. How about when Jesus talks to people when he says that you're either going to, if you want to follow me, you have to hate. You know, we read it and we read this thing where they're like, I don't want to hate my mother, brother, sister. But he says, but if you want to follow me, you have to love me more and love them less. And we all know what that looks like. You ever been pulled by your family? How about your family's customs that they want you to pull you there more so than your devotion 
to Jesus. You can't serve two masters. You're either going to love one or hate the other. And this is what God is saying about money. He's saying this itself is not evil. Money is amoral. It does not have a good or evil nature. It is a dollar bill. It's a tool. It's a tool. But let's talk about how emotional we get when we talk about the tool. <laughs> it may not be good or bad or have a nature in and of itself, but we sure have this feeling. And I'm just being like, this is like a time when I have really needed this message. And it's interesting when, when you get into moments when God really is like, I'm going to reveal your heart. So here's what I, I felt like kind of this whole thing with, you're either going to love one or hate the other. Who in here is married? Or ha who in here has ever worked? How about that? Okay. <laughs> Your hand's still up. <laughs> I am married and I have also worked, okay? <laughs> that is me. Um, in this passage, when he's saying that there's one true God, part of that, in our giving, we will declare our dependence and our devotion. And it's about giving first. It's about giving first. How about when you go through your bills, and let's just, we're just talking about money for a minute. We're going to talk about, kind of get there. You go through your bills, and you've paid everything, and you're like, this is what I've got left, so there you go. How about when you're married, and you give a token offering of affection to your spouse? It's your leftovers. Anybody know what, that, what I'm talking about? Come on, I've been married 23 years. I've given a few token offerings. You all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but it's not your first. You're giving a token offering. I'm like, this is, this is what I have left. Or employees that come to work and they give a token offering. It's not their devotion. It's not their energy. It's not their effort. It's a token offering. And our offering will always declare who is the most important in our lives? Like when I talked about marriage, when I give a token offering to Eric, it's because I am the most important person in my life and not him. When I give a token offering to God, it's saying, <laughs> yeah. When I give a token offering to God, it's saying, I don't, my devotion is to this, it's to my kingdom, it's to my world, but it's not to yours. And this whole thread in Matthew, and I know I'm probably like up in everybody's business, but I just feel like that's what Jesus is saying. Like if we look through this, he's saying, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth because it's going to go away. But sow into the kingdom of heaven. When you give into heaven, it will last forever. He's saying, have a good eye, one that is looking forward. He's saying, you just can't serve two masters. It's not that you don't want to, it's that we can't. You are going to love something more, and we are going to love something less. So when it comes to giving, when we give first, I am dethroning the sense that this is my master. Every time I give, and at every time I give first, because sometimes giving first is painful, I don't know, maybe you're in a good financial situation, maybe you're not, but giving first sometimes actually really hurts. But I'm saying, you know what? I'm giving because God is first, he is my provider, and he wants to bless the rest of it. Our offering will always declare our devotion and our dependence. Let's turn to Matthew, or sorry, Mark 12, 41 through 44. told Eric I was um, actually as I had volunteered to do this message but as I was preparing I didn't know that this would be the season where I had just quit my job <laughs> and I am dying I'm not kidding you every morning I'm waking up and I'm dying I'm feeling the gap and I'm the fear and I'm thinking this is not an emotional thing but this is an emotional thing when it comes to this and, and I just am so blessed that the Lord actually had me look at this because it's, you know, kind of with fasting, he talked about we can talk about that we are God-reliant and not self-reliant. But sometimes it takes a little bit of a press to actually look to see, am I actually really God-reliant? 
because it will come out. Mark 12, I want to talk about, so the first thing, and my first point, if you missed it, was that there is one true God and that our offering declares that. Our offering will declare who is Lord and who is not. Second thing, I want to talk about how Jesus acknowledges and honors the offering. And this is what I love about Jesus. I love so many things about Jesus. You know, the more that I'm in the word, the more I am in love with him. He's, he's better than we know. So Mark 12, I love this. Verse 41. Now Jesus sat opposite the treasury. So I want you to see this. Jesus strategically placed himself, if the treasury is here, maybe this is the wrong position, but Jesus strategically placed himself in a position to watch the offering. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> like, he, like nothing Jesus did was without intention. So Jesus is like, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to watch the offering. I'm like, okay. And he saw how the people put money into the treasury. And many who, put, who were rich put in much. Then one poor widow came and threw in two mites, which make a, makes a quadrants. So he called his disciples to himself and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury. For they put in out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty put in all she had, her whole livelihood." What I want to show you in this passage is so not only did Jesus position himself to watch the offering, he's watching and people are coming and, and some are putting in, but some are just throwing in the token offering, right? They're just throwing in like the little bit and, and this is what I feel like I have to give. And then he watches this widow who is completely dependent on the kindness of other people. And he watches her and she walks up and she places in, and I'm, I'm assuming in the midst of this, that there is pain in her offering. That she places in everything that she has. Then Jesus takes the moment to call his disciples for a teaching moment. He watches, he stops, he calls his disciples to himself, and he says, did you see what just happened there? Others put in money out of their abundance, but this woman, out of her need and out of the giving, this woman, out of her need, when she put in that two mites, you know what she was saying? The offering always says something. She said, Lord, you are God, and this is not. And I actually could never provide for myself. But I am taking what I have and I am putting my trust in the provision that you have. And I'm not going to hold on to this little bit of provision that I have. Because I know that if I take this and I place it at your feet, that you will multiply it. And Jesus honors the offering. He not only watched the offering, he took the moment and he said, boys, come here. Boys that have been following me around. I know you've missed this, but come on, boys, I want to show you something. Do you see that woman? Maybe from the looking of your eyes, it looks good like everybody else is putting in, but I am stripping away and I see the heart. And she just declared, you are God, this is not, and I need you more than anything else. Jesus honors the offering. He honors when we give first. He honors when we give, and it hurts a little bit. Second thing, to declare that he honors the offering. How about, let's actually flip there really quick. I wasn't going to flip there, but I just want to look at it. It's Matthew 26. Jesus honoring the offering that we give him when we declare that he is the Lord and that he is good and that he's the provider and he's everything that we need and we have nothing else without him. I realize this is a different kind of offering, but I love Jesus' response. So Matthew 6, 26, starting in verse 6. And when Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him having an alabaster flask of very costly fragrant oil, and she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. When his disciples saw it, they were indignant, upset, a little bit irritated, with the woman, why this waste? Why this waste? For this fragrant oil might have been sold for much and given to the poor. 
But when Jesus was aware of it, he said to him, why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a good work for me. For you have, will have the poor with you always, but me you do not always have with you. And basically, I'm not going to read the rest of it, but it says that this will be talked about forever. Jesus honored the widow, and he honored the woman that take, and she poured out this offering before him. And not only... And now we're reading about her offering. And now we're reading about the offering that she gave that cost her something. And I'm just guessing, but I bet that that offering cost her more than just what she was pouring out. I bet it took her laying down her dignity to walk into that room. I bet as the disciples, because it says that the disciples were indignant, enough that Jesus basically said, why do you trouble her? Like, he's telling them, leave her alone. They're probably, like, up in her face. Like, why, why this waste? And, you know, woman. <laughs> and, and, and Jesus is like, why are you troubling her? You don't understand what she just poured out upon me. And this is not necessarily talking about that, but I, I just kind of felt during worship, you know, we were, had dinner at Dale and Charlene's last night, and I shared a little bit of my testimony, just a small portion of my testimony, and how when I was 19, how the Lord broke into the bedroom of a girl who had been in darkness and in despair, in, I mean, in every kind of darkness, and I met the Lord. He entered into my bedroom, and I encountered him. And kind of like the woman pouring out the offering, and they're, they're indignant, and they're like, why this offering? I was during worship, and I thought, God forbid that I tone it down. God forbid that I tone it down, and I forget that God broke in, and he stole me out of darkness, and said, like, opened up in a marvelous light. I was telling them the day after I got saved, I walked outside, and I was like, holy cow, trees are green. Gra I mean, it was like dead. I was dead, dead, dead. And I'm like, look at this. This is the Jesus that deserves the, the honorable offering that we're bringing to him. I'm not trying to be um, <laughs> yelling, but I just feel the Lord. Like, this week as I was preparing this, and all week I was under attack. And, and I just literally felt the Lord say to me as I was quitting my job and feeling the pain of it, I heard him say to me, he said, Amanda, I see that offering. I see that offering. I saw that. And I even felt today just that the Lord wanted to speak to some people that he sees your offering. He sees the offering of you maybe doing something you don't want to do, but you're being obedient. And I felt like he just wanted to acknowledge that, like I see your offering. He sees your offering when you're kind to someone that is not kind to you. I saw that offering. Just like he pulled his disciples aside and he said, do you see that? Do you see her devotion? Do you see how devoted she is? Or about the woman that pours it out, he said, do, do you see? This will be spoken of forever. You think you understand an offering, but this woman actually understood an offering that you had no grid for. And she walked in obedience and offered it before me. But I just kind of felt like the Lord was saying that there's some people in here that you need to know that is your offering. And to be encouraged, like that it means something. I was talking to my daughter on the phone the other day, and this is a small thing, but she's going to nursing school and she's working, and she said, Mom, I started waking up at 4.30 in the morning because I want to spend time with the Lord. And she said, the other day I could feel the pleasure of the Lord over it. I see your offering. Maybe it's a little lack of sleep. <laughs> Maybe it's your job. Maybe it's, it's you're saying, I'm, I'm setting my life, but the Lord says, you know what, I see that offering. And I think I just want my life to be, I want heaven leaning in and saying, I see that, more than I want the world saying, you know what, that doesn't look like much. Or why waste? Why the waste? And not caring about the opinions of others, but saying, God, I want my offering to be pure before you, and I want you to look, and I want you to honor it. So that's point two. Jesus honors the offering. He honors when we give. He honors when we give first. There is a treasure. Just like in the rest of the chapter, chapter where it talks about not storing up treasures on this earth, but treasures in heaven, the treasure that we get when we say, I'm going to put this 
to you, to your ways, to your things. There is a treasure that we are actually storing up that we don't even understand. Third thing, and this I think is probably one of the most important things. In that chapter, he says, therefore, do not worry. And he starts to talk about how, why are you worried? I clothe the grass, the lilies, the fields. Don't you think I'm going to actually take care of the rest of all the things of your life? If we are to seek first the kingdom of God, we need to know that we serve a benevolent king. I think a lot of times we don't give, and we don't give first because we do not understand how good and how benevolent the king we serve is. And that's what he's saying. He's saying, I want you to actually like get your heart a little unattached from this fear of lack, this fear of not having enough, and I want you to see that I am a good, good king. If I will take care of the smallest things, such as creation and the lilies, what makes you think I won't take care of my children? And then he talks in there and he says, you're seeking after, what am I going to (laughs) eat? Come on, I know, like, we've been in situations, like, when we lived in Rocky Boy, we had nothing. (laughs) I know when you're in a situation where you're like, I don't know where my next meal is going to come from. Like, where you're like, I don't even know how we're going to pay these bills. And he's like, why are you saying these things? The Gentiles, people that have no covenant with my God, those are the ones that are worried because they don't have a covenant with a God that has declared himself to be provider and king and savior and Lord. They have a reason to say, where are we going to get these things? But you don't because you have a good king who is faithful, who provides. There's a clause, though. And I'm sure we've all quoted it, but Matthew 6, So here's the thing about a king and a kingdom. We don't actually get to dictate to the king how things should go. It's crazy. I know it would be really nice to be like, Jesus, this, here's how I think this should, should go. Because at one, it makes me less uncomfortable. There's no faith. There's no risk. Let's do that. And Jesus is like, that's really cute. But that's not how my kingdom goes. And I want you to do it my way. So Matthew 6.33 says, when we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, then he adds everything else unto us. But a lot of times we're like, but I'll seek you later. So as I've been um, processing, like the room is like, (laughs) it's, it's, there's like, you can feel the, it's uncomfortable. (laughs) It is uncomfortable to say the least. Um, and this is all obviously just personal stuff. So we have been in the midst of me like feeling like the Lord was saying, this was time for me to quit my job. There is a huge gap in our finances. And we have this project to get a rental going because, you know, we're going to like, this will help supplement income. Blah, blah, blah. Don't care. But anyway, I'm just telling you some backdrop. So I was praying one day, and I felt like the Lord just wanted me over here doing some stuff. And I heard him say to me when it came to this issue, he said, Amanda, if you will build my house, then I'll build yours. And that is what I feel like Matthew 6.33 says. If you will build my house, then I'll build yours. So when we seek first, when we give treasures in heaven, when our eye is not evil but it's good, when we're not serving two masters but we're serving one, and he said, if you build my kingdom, then I'll take care of yours. And that's what this whole flow through Matthew is saying. He's saying, look, if you do it my way, I will make sure that you have all of your needs met. And sometimes there is like this, it's faith. It's faith. Because that is how the kingdom of God operates. It operates on faith. And a lot of times we're like, but God, when I see it, then I'll do it. When I have, when I have it, I'll do it. And God's like, but when you give, then I'll come through. And as I was praying this morning, this is what I felt like I heard the Lord say. He said to me that some of you in here that he wants to start building a history with. He said that I want to start building a history with my people of my faithfulness, of my covenant in giving. 
But the only way to build a history with God in doing that is by doing it his way, is by giving first so he can show up in his faithfulness. In Malachi 3, which I mean, I'm not going to get into a conversation about the tithe. You can do your own due diligence on whatever. But Matthew 3 is talking about the tithe. Oh, sorry, did I say Matthew? Malachi, thank you. I was like waiting. Do I want to say what I was going to say? No. (laughs) Well, okay. (laughs) He's not the best here. Um, I heard somebody talk once. He was talking about how someone came up to him and he said, I want to talk to you about how I don't think the tithe is New Covenant, and I don't think the tithe is good. And he said, okay, well, so what kind of conversation do you want to have? Do you want to give more, or do you want to give less than 10%? (laughs) And it always stuck out to me, because I thought, in the New Covenant of Grace, are we trying to hold back more with the abundance that God has poured out? Do you want to give more, or do you want to give less? And at that moment, I was like, ooh, that's a good question. Do I want to give more, or do I want to give less? But... (laughs) But here's what I felt like the Lord said. He said that I want to make a history with some people in here. Malachi 3 says, bring all the tithe into the storehouse. I mean, I'm I'm sure a lot of people in here have read it. Bring the tithe into the storehouse, but it says, do not rob God. And I'm not so much going to talk about robbing God because it belongs to him, which I believe that it does. I believe that it all belongs to him, and I believe 10% is a very small offering to give the one who brought me out of darkness into light. It's a very small, uncostly offering. It's, it costs very little. But what I feel like he wanted to emphasize on will a man rob God is will you rob me of the opportunity to pour out my blessings which you cannot contain? God wants to make history with us, but the only way it's going to happen is if we actually partner with him to do it his way. Will a man rob God? And, and here's how I felt. I felt like he's like chomping at the bit. He's like, I just have all this stuff that I want to pour out, but will you rob me because you won't actually take a step? Because you won't take a moment and say, this is yours. This hurts because I have bills to pay, because everything is upside down. This hurts, but will you take a step so God can actually pour out his blessing which you cannot contain? I have story after story after story after story how God has provided for Eric and I through the years. And I felt like he was talking to me about how he wants to make history with you. He said, Amanda, when I called you to quit your job this time, you're fine. You know why? You have history. You have history. You have history with me where I've provided for you and you've watched me pour out my blessings. So you know what you need to do is you need to recall that history, you need to recall my word, and you need to bring it back to me. So I'm like, Lord, I just thank you that this is what you said. (laughs) Fully exposing myself. Um, I guess not fully. That'd be awkward. Um, (laughs) Sorry, this is not how I meant this to go. But (laughs) bear with me. So, and I'm going to just be totally transparent here. So in the middle of this process for me, as, as I'm navigating obedience... I mean, I, I'm doing something. I mean, it's just, but there, by doing what I'm doing, there was definitely, I, I took a cut in, in life. <laughs> Not like that, in money. So I'm processing our, our budget, okay? So I, I, I know that there's not this income coming in, and I'm processing our budget, and I'm looking at it, and, you know, we've got this stuff going on, and, and, and we tithe, and then we give to, like, missionaries, So full disclosure, this is embarrassing, but I'm going to say it. So I'm like thinking, and I'm like, well, maybe I should like cut out a missionary or two. Okay, I'm like so embarrassed to say this. And I heard the Holy Spirit say to me, that's your plan, huh? (laughs) And I just feel like the Lord is offering, he's like, is that your plan? Like that's your plan is to like cut out sowing into the kingdom of God and like you're going to, that's your plan, huh? You're going to. (laughs) <laughs> and I just felt like he's like, that's a good plan? And, and it was so challenging and encouraging and stretching. And I just feel like the Lord is saying, would you give me an opportunity? He's just looking for an opportunity to actually bless your life. God can provide quicker than your little bit any day. And he wants to. 
So that's kind of where we're landing. Just to remember that there's one true God and it's not our money. And every time you give, you're declaring that I have one true God and it's not that. Every time you give, you make that declaration. God, I'm devoted to you. I'm devoted to your kingdom and I'm dependent on you. Just like the widow, her declaration, she didn't say it, but she said it. She said, I am devoted to you and I am dependent on you and I'm going to put some money where my mouth is. So every time we give, we make a declaration of who is God and who is not. Second, God honors the offering. He honors the offering. He's a kind, good, 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 good God. His pleasure is upon us when we give and it's painful. Sometimes it's the best thing we can do is give when it's painful. Because I think we have forgotten what it feels like to sacrifice. Jesus did the ultimate sacrifice for us out of generous love. And he sees offerings that cost us and his pleasure is upon it. And then the last thing is that we serve a greater kingdom and he's a good, good king. So, you guys want to close us out. The worship team, if you'd come up and I'm just going to pray. So if everybody wants to stand up. So here's my encouragement. Is that you would invite the Holy Spirit into this place when it comes to giving. That we wouldn't make assumptions and we wouldn't think our way out of an opportunity. But that you would actually invite the Holy Spirit into this conversation so that he can bless it and that he can multiply it.